when you see that kind of filmmaking, you're like, oh, oh shit. This is the real deal. He just had this really exciting energy where I knew things were going to change. There's something very authentic and special about the worlds that he creates. I love his passion and I love his um, breadth of vision. He is a rare combination of Zen, Taoist, and crazy. In Alfonso Coron's Children of Men, the world's youngest person has just died in a dystopian future where humans are infertile. The long, unbroken opening shot demonstrates Coron's drive for naturalism. But the elaborate cinematography is not done for its own sake. Instead, it gives viewers a visceral experience of the characters' worlds and the issues they confront. It's got to feel real, totally organic, without any misstep of contrivance. In Alfonso's work, it's never just what the story of the movie is. The, the themes are always bigger than that. The first scene in Children of Man, I walk into the street, and a bomb goes off. And we're saying, we say with that, this is the world we live in. He deals with all those big themes in such a subtle and emotional way, and in a way that's truly kinetic. From raw Mexican indies to Oscar-winning spectacles, Coron's cinema is infused with rich characters and bold politics that target the heart of human emotion. I'd been a fan of his since he sort of hit the scene in, in uh, Hollywood. I think I said something to the effect of, when are we going to work together? And it was another 10 years or so. No me parece que tenga un estilo determinado porque haga, haga todo el rato el mismo tipo de cine. Al contrario, me parece de un ecléctico increíble. Alfonso is really good at working with kids. He treats them more like adults, but he also himself acts like a kid. Born in Mexico City in 1961, Alfonso Coron grows up in a middle-class academic family and studies cinema at Mexico's National University. But he's expelled alongside his future cinematographer, Emmanuel Lubezki, after they clash with their conservative teachers. Coron then finds himself navigating Mexico's TV industry where he meets another partner in crime. Well, when Alfonso and I were coming up, we were very much guerrilla filmmakers, independent of the union, independent of cultural institutions. We wanted to do film to do film, not to be famous. We just wanted to make movies. Coron breaks onto Mexico's film scene in 1991 when he reunites with cinematographer Lubezki to make Solo con tu pareja, a screwball comedy about a womanizing yuppie who's falsely diagnosed with HIV. He wanted to do a movie that was commercial, fun, uh, fresh. This was during Alfonso's, what we jokingly call his green period. The character's unusual morning newspaper routine allows Coron to showcase the kinetic visual style and distinctive color palette that would become trademarks of his partnership with Lubezki. Yo cuando me lo contó, la volví a ver sabiéndolo y flipas con la cantidad de matices, de matices y de tonos que pueda haber de un mismo color. Cuarón even uses a green slip of paper to tell the womanizer he's infected with HIV, a comedic plot point on a taboo subject that really connects with audiences. For many, many years, it was the highest grossing Mexican film in history. But the young director clashes with the Mexican film industry and takes an offer from abroad to adapt a children's classic. Alfonso was working with a budget that was much larger than we ever dreamt we would have. And his ambitions were so much loftier. It's one of the most sort of stunningly, beautifully told, you know, children's stories. A Little Princess is the story of Sarah, a boarding school student. When her father goes missing in World War I, the headmistress forces her into servitude, making her live in the attic. I am a princess. Oh. All girls are. Even if they live in tiny old attics? Even if they dress in rags? Sarah mirrors Coron's own defiant nature when she fights back. They're still princesses, all of us. This very inclusive idea about who could and who couldn't be a princess. It's quite a political statement in a way. 
It's almost like he transposes his own energy onto his films, which is a raw, passionate, spontaneous energy. Though A Little Princess is not a commercial success, it shows Coron's ability to create vivid worlds, earning him the chance to adapt Dickens' Great Expectations, which had already been made into a classic film. When Alfonso told me he was making that movie, I said to him, it's like remaking Citizen Kane. Alfonso is enamored of the idea of youth and uh, the eternal optimism of youth. Surrounded by green accents, this precocious childhood kiss marks the moment Finn falls in love with Estella, the girl that will ultimately break his heart. He was thrilled to be doing a studio film. You know, he'd been working on really small projects before that. Like kids in a candy store, Quaron and Lubeski use their bigger Hollywood budget to develop the immersive camera work that will come to define the look of their films. It's a movie full of experimentation. There's a great, very long shot that lasts for an entire camera reel where uh, we follow Finn through the street into a gallery outside. This nearly five minute shot shows Quaron's drive for cinematic innovation. The camera follows Ethan Hawke as a grown up Finn through five separate settings as he searches for Gwyneth Paltrow as Estella. Finn. Sorry, sir. That single take is so formalist, is very much uh, an almost technical prowess being displayed. You know, we can do this. While Coron's hyper-stylized vision impresses audiences, the film is criticized for its thin story and characters. It was never going to be a hit. It's it just, it just not designed that way. The characters were so remote, and I think Alfonso acknowledges that. He realized the insincerity that lied for him in a movie that was 100% great looking. Everything was too polished, and he went to the completely opposite experiment. Coron returns to Mexico and strips his filmmaking down to basics. The result is the erotically charged coming of age story about two young friends with one thing on their minds. The raw naturalism of this masturbation scene is deliberately provocative, refusing to mask the gritty sexuality of the teenage boys. The pool scene's amazing because you don't expect it. People were shocked by how graphic it was. Very old, you know, uh, uh, academy members are now gonna go see a guy sort of jerking off into a swimming pool. Felt very risque. I think I watched it like 13, 14, which is probably younger than is recommended. Gael Garcia Bernal and Diego Luna play teenagers who hit the road for a beach holiday with the Spanish woman they both lust after. Entonces era esa, esa, esa peli es que fue una experiencia porque yo iba descubriendo México según lo iba descubriendo Luisa. Y así lo quiso además Alfonso. Primero un paquecito, ¿no? Para calentar esa peli. Coron injects the racy travelogue with a documentary element. The image of the police outside the car windows points to the political unrest and social inequity that are facts of life in much of Mexico. He's very aware of the world, socially and politically. So I, I couldn't imagine him doing a project that those things wouldn't somehow leak in. But it wasn't just political and it wasn't just a social comment. It was also dirty and sexy. Near the end of their journey, Luisa and the boys let go of their inhibitions over the course of an unbroken seven-minute shot. Y tu mamá también takes that idea of the really long single take and pushes it. The camera is very free. And for me, it's the most beautiful moment in the movie. You know, it's a moment of truth. The dance in the cantina ends in a three-way sex scene that exposes the characters beyond their nudity. Que nunca he rodado escenas tan tan bestias y tan explícitas de una manera tan cómoda, tan cordial, tan estupenda. Me dice Maribel, o sea, a ver qué les haces para que. In the middle of the passion moment, the two boys kiss each other, and you realize that's the love story they were looking for. He found it more subversive and more interesting 
and he's always looking for those edges because it feels raw and of the moment. A box office smash in Mexico and sensation abroad, Itumama Tambien relaunches Coron's career. But given the film's explicit content, many are shocked when he's picked to direct another famous trio. Alfonso called me about the Harry Potter thing because uh, he was nervous about doing a sequel. And I basically said, look, if you really give it your all, it'll be your movie. You're going to leave DNA everywhere. Grounding the fantasy franchise in a greater sense of realism, Coron adds a tougher edge to Harry Potter's world in The Prisoner of Azkaban. The first thing he asked me to do was to write this essay about my character. But the way that he asked was, I don't know as much about Hermione as you do, and I need you to tell me about how you see her. And I was like, please, can Hermione wear jeans? And he was like, yeah, why not? I was like, amazing. Coron transforms the wide-eyed kids of the first two films into angst-ridden teens. Hermione demonstrates this darker, tougher sensibility in a confrontation with Harry's nemesis, Draco Malfoy. You, you foul, loathsome, them evil little cockroach! Hermione, no! He's not worth it. Alfonso did, like, three shots closer and then up on the hill and then, like, further back. He gave it suspense. That was a very empowering film for Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Oh. The sort of verve and attack of that movie never feels formulaic or contrived or boxed in. You know, it's full of spirit and full of life. It is the most critically successful Harry Potter. It made a lot of money too, but it was also really well loved. It was a really good movie. Despite his success, Quaron turns down the chance to return to the Potter universe, instead opting for a futuristic hell. I met Alfonso. And the way he talked about children and men, I knew I wanted to be just part of that vision, and I took, kind of took the leap. Children of Men stars Clive Owen as Theo, a disillusioned journalist living in 2027, where infertility threatens the survival of humankind. He sent me the Battle of Algiers, which I'd never seen, and basically said, this is kind of my inspiration, it's my template. The influence of the film's intensely realistic portrayal of the Algerian war is evident in Alfonso Cuaron's approach to the visuals in Children of Men. The filmmaker trades in the barbed wire of French colonists in Algeria for detention cages holding refugees in 2027 England. Alfonso was very clear. He said, look, I'm not making a movie about the future. I'm making a movie about now. Immigration has become a huge theme in the last couple of years, and it's a massive theme of children and men. Julianne Moore plays Theo's activist ex-wife, who pays him to help her smuggle a refugee woman out of the country. Oh, f off. You've got to be kidding. You know how many people I've tried I this with? Know. You'll be happy to know, out of the hundreds, hundreds. you are still the I'm only not doing one. It. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you the are. car's moving yes, too much. We had Clive and I come up with that nutty game where we toss the ping pong ball back and forth. It's an emotional sleight of hand. So you take the audience's attention off of what's happening, and then you're able to take them completely by surprise. Quaron brings his love of the long take to a new extreme. When the activists are ambushed, the director films the entire battle from inside the car. The four-minute sequence took 12 days to shoot. When they were setting up the car rig, there was a guy that was, had been doing car rigs for 25 years. And I, I witnessed this conversation with the guy saying, it can't be done, mate. And Alfonso going, yes, it can. And we will do it. The rig that was on the top of the, of the Fiat that moved around, and as the rig moved, someone would kind of slide back in their chair, and the camera would go over your head and go to the person behind you and back and forth. Blood splatters onto the camera. He has the uncanny ability to come up with the most inventive shots. It changed sort of the way you looked at how those kind of scenes can be shot. But in the meantime, you're telling a story that's incredibly personal and small. But Alfonso has that kind of vision and is able to, to tell a story that big and, and insert these wonderfully emotional moments into it. Theo is a lost soul. He's kind of given up, and he's very apathetic at the beginning of the movie. In a visual reference to the Christian nativity scene, 
I'm scared. Theo discovers the refugee woman is pregnant, and his cynicism melts away. Please help me. Suddenly, there is potential for the human race. You know, it's the thing that does change Theo. Jesus Christ. And start to galvanizing and bring back his faith. It's a film that, the next day and the other, the other, you think so many things about this life, so many things. This life, of death, of everything. Stop! Cease fire! Cease firing! Despite the darkness of this futuristic vision, Coron shows our capacity for hope when others witness the miracle of the first newborn in decades. We live in a violent, unpredictable world. But amidst all of that, there's great kind of hope and faith in humanity. Though not quite a blockbuster, Coron's political thriller is celebrated for its superb direction and ingenious long takes. But he pushes the boundaries of cinema and storytelling even further in his next project. Alfonso asks me to connect him with Jim Cameron to discuss the tools that exist for virtual camera and virtual filmmaking. Jim calls me later, he says, this is a really smart guy. But what he wants is technology that doesn't exist. He's about seven years ahead of the future. Alfonso brings the best part of being Mexican into it. And he goes, there are no tools, let me make them. At the time, Alfonso was just kidding himself. He was like, this is really gonna be just a, a small little movie in space. Inspired by his childhood obsession with space, Quaron and his son Jonas write Gravity, a survival story about a female astronaut. The hook in the movie is the opening shot. Man down! Man down! Gravity's epic 17-minute long opening shows Sandra Bullock and George Clooney's spaceship being destroyed by satellite debris. Freed from cinema's usual rules of axis and perspective, the shot puts audiences right in the action. The shifting perspective, the floating up there, was so technically brilliantly achieved. I felt like it was a visceral experience, like some special ride. I felt I'd never seen a movie or be taken to a place like it before. Houston, I lost visual, Dr. Stone. There's something incredibly vital and urgent. You know this is being done with no safety net. Determined to credibly simulate a zero-gravity experience, Coron devises a dome rigged with nearly two million LED bulbs to replicate light and shadow in space and puts his actors in a complicated mechanical rig. This wasn't green screen. You're moving, the camera's moving, everything's sort of in this wild dance. It's tricky because you've been dead bolted into this piece of machinery that rotates you around like this inside the ball. And this thing goes like that, but you're looking up and these are a bunch of guys on computers, literally like, ha, ha, ha. and you're going, you're sure you got this now? You're sure that that's not good? Because it would just take your head off. The logistical challenges cause many production delays, and it starts to look as if Coron's ambitious project may fail. We did our first test screening, and because the effects weren't in, it tested as bad as any film you could imagine. And the studio was like, uh-oh. And he was like, uh-oh. With $100 million at risk, the production stretches on with no end in sight. He's like, I've been working on this thing for five years. I, don't, I haven't done anything else, and you know, I'm broke. Well, I was begging him to just do commercials. You know, the Coen brothers do commercials. And he's like, I, don't, I just don't want to do it. Maybe you're right, I need the money. And then we went back and we did some reshoots. And bit by bit, the technology caught up. Even as he struggles with the technical hurdles, Coron never loses sight of the raw human story at the film's core. Bullock's astronaut is racked by grief after losing a child, and she's repeatedly associated with images of birth. That shot of her in this sort of fetal position on that ship, you'll never forget that image. It's like painting worthy. Even though it be set in space, the whole thing just feels so human. It's just all about like our will to survive. We couldn't stop talking about how emotional it was. You know, it's hard to make a movie with somebody in space by themselves, <laughs> you know? Many times people came to Alfonso and said, make her a guy. And Alfonso felt that it would completely diffuse the movie because that was falling in with the norms of what people think of a hero. Ella está tan maravillosa. El trabajo que hace esa mujer tan sutil, tan bonito. Tan bonito. 
<laughs> she clings to life, and it ends with that character coming to grips with the miracle of gravity, of the fact that she can put a foot on the moth and another foot on the moth, and it's about a rebirth. It's a miracle of a movie that tested the limits of film and of human endurance. Finally complete, Caron's risky endeavor faces a tough audience at its world premiere. To go to the Venice Film Festival with a sort of sci-fi-ish movie, 3D, where they're all putting on 3D glasses, you're really asking to get your bell rung, you know, by the Italians. And the place went batshit. I mean, batshit. The minute it happened, I looked over at Alfonso. I said, don't, don't worry about doing a commercial. You'll be fine. Gravity grosses over $700 million worldwide. And Coron becomes the first Mexican filmmaker to win the Oscar for Best Director. We were watching at home, and we were so moved. We were so moved, we were, my mother called me uh, in tears and she said, I feel as happy as if you were there. And I go, so do I. The guy will do something ambitious. He will go, right, I'm gonna use the space I've created to do something, you know, original, daring. It would be impossible for Alfonso to make a film that felt sleepy or dead in some way. He's too, he's too vibrant for that, he's too alive for that. He keeps a watchful eye over our humanity. And his movies reflect that. And I think the world is better for that. But yeah, I, I, listen, I, I, the last thing I would think of him as a Mexican director, I think of him as a director, you know? Totally. Straight, straight up. Um. But he is a Mexican. I think it's important. And uh, don't tell Donald Trump that. That's a really good point. I just, I'm just saying, so you know, he could be kicked out any minute. So we might, we might have to lose this because this is a real giveaway. Yeah, this would be trouble. Okay, okay. 